Gigi Berardi here, Reading Food Wise, and I'm going to begin the section on whole while growing. Read a page. And uh, then I would like to focus on eating on a budget. I got that uh, question today when speaking with a group of very lively students at Western Washington University. So let's do it. Let's, uh, let's talk about how it's possible to be food wise and to eat on a budget. Um, this discussion introduces animal protein and livestock and uh, there are a number of environmental issues people perceive uh, around production and consumption of those kinds of products. So let's, let's take that on also. I think as we'll see, nothing is black or white, which I know is not fun to hear, um, but I think it is, which is why I wrote the book. Whole while growing. We've been thinking about what happens to a food item, be it grain, nut, fruit, vegetable, chicken, or egg, after it is harvested. But the same food wise principles apply to the plant or animal while it is growing. Don't change its nature and don't add chemicals to enhance flavor or growth. In some cases, this is as simple as not spraying any herbicides in your backyard, gardens or on your cornfields. But this measure of wholeness applies to animal agriculture too. Wholeness values connections between farmers and their flocks and herds. Connection means farmers are linked physically on site to their animals that they can determine firsthand which individuals are ready for slaughter and market and which are vulnerable to disease and digestive orders. Large confined animal operations, referred to as CAFOs, C-A-F-O-S, can be classified for regulatory purposes according to the number of confined animals. And I have so many references to each of these statements in the back of this book. But you can see how it would clutter up the text to include them on the page. Typically in large operations, the flocks or herds may have little opportunity to express their animalness. That's normal animal behavior. Their ability to recognize individuals in the flock or herd or to forage in the case of chickens. To forage widely for feed, even with the organic label in some situations, the animals may have only minimal access to the outdoors. Pastured, labeled chickens, for which you know something about the scale of operation, this is key, and the extent to which animals have free range to outdoor fields and grass might be the best choice. Experience huge chicken operations and you may be inspired to start your own backyard egg laying project. I certainly was. Does this mean, does this mean we need a chicken in every yard? Well, not exactly, but enormous chicken operations are rarely the only alternative. Smaller scale works and within 30 minutes of where I live, two growers keep 250 to 600 chickens at a time. The chickens are out in the field where they're chicken tractors. So that, that is um, a movable fenced in protective unit with nesting boxes if the hens are laying, are large enough to allow for some natural behavior. This promotes good health and physical comfort for the chickens. Agricultural populist writer farmer Joel Salatin calls this integrity farming. With animal products, what we consider whole is sometimes partly a question of our attitudes toward non-human animals. Foodwise is choosing to consciously consider what we consume, keeping personal budget, values, and tastes in mind. But what is the right number of chickens to be raising? If 10,000 is too many, how do we know that 600 is not? We don't. This brings us back to the food wise, food wise approach. Experience it for yourself. What's your observation? If you don't happen to have local chicken farms in your area, take a look on the internet. Just type chicken farm tour and your geographic area 
in your web browser. That is exactly how I am teaching in agroecology and sustainable agriculture class right now at Western Washington University. We are using our web browsers. Okay, so what to eat? Well, number one, we humans, I will speak for myself, can probably get by with less food. Yes, indeed, we can. Um, and I speak for myself because I know that to be the case. Uh, so consider it. Try. Experiment in the food-wise way. <laughs> experiment with how much food you need. Number two, focus on greens and beans. So I buy rice in 25 pound bags and uh, a kind of a bee pea lentil mix, also in 25 pound bags. For me, I can afford to be um, interested in where that's coming from and if it's organic or not. Sometimes I buy organic and sometimes I don't. It depends on what is available, especially right now. Um, with that bean mix, um, I can soak the beans overnight in, uh, in water, and sometimes I add a little whey to it to kickstart the fermentation, which I have uh, left over from cheese making or just from any thick natural type of yogurt will have the whey protein faction um, settling to the top and you can use that or a little bit of salt soaked overnight and then cooked with spices. And uh, the uh, next item to bear in mind is that you can forage for these grains and beans. I think I have that as item number four in the description of this video. But um, dandelions, dandelion greens are still delicious and tender. I've just made dandelion wine and I keep meaning to shoot a blog blog on uh, on dandelion wine. But if you just Google my name and dandel dandelion wine, you'll find a recipe. It's the last recipe and a very special recipe in the Food Wise book. Um, nettles, um, they're not too mature at this point, depends on where you're looking. Dead nettles, mustards. Um, the third item I had in the description that goes with this video is complementing proteins. And I actually didn't talk about it uh, very much at all. In the book, I did more in my book called Finding Balance in 2005. And there's a link to a lecture uh, on complementing programs, um, proteins, which was popularized by Francis Moore LePay, who wrote a foreword to um, a book I produced in 1985. Um, and, uh, and she endorsed FoodWise um, this year. So I have I followed her work for a long time. Her popular book on this topic was called, is called Diet for a Small Planet. And she popularized this idea of complementing proteins. That is combining uh, dairy and uh, seeds and uh, beans and grains. Uh, so as to uh, have a complete protein in your meal or within a space of two hours of eating. And uh, if you Google complementing proteins, you will get a lot of diagrams that show the relationship between those four food groups. And the idea is that the deficiencies in amino acid complementation load in one food, for example, grains, are complemented by the strong, the, the larger presence of those deficit amino acids in another food group. Now, this is a little contested as to what this is, how it works, and if it's necessary. Frangie LaPay was super defensive when she wrote this book. She had to be, because in the 1960s, 
she was on what she called the soybean circuit. And she was preaching an important message about reducing or eliminating animal products in our diet, that those animal products, that animal protein was not necessary to have a healthy diet. That was her revolutionary message and she received a lot of flack for it. So she felt that she had to, and she did, investigate this and determine what kind of diet, healthy or otherwise, as she was using that adjective at the time, uh, could be put together by avoiding uh, animal meats. Uh, nevertheless, it is an interesting guideline and the food groups that you would normally or naturally put together are actually pretty much descriptive of what many cultures choose uh, in terms of combining foods anyway. I invite you to take a look. Um, so in this theme, a little bit of animal protein, a little bit of dairy goes a long way, literally and figuratively.